Yeah, what the Holocaust uh, teaches us about uh, America and, um, and what Ken Burns' film teaches us about America. Um, it's called the U.S. and the Holocaust, and the stress is really on the U.S. Of all the Holocaust footage is extraordinary. It's footage you have never, ever seen before. You can be, you know, watching movies about World War II and the Holocaust for your whole life, and you will never have seen footage as you see in this Ken Burns film. So today we're going to study that here on bigotry in America. The stress is bigotry in America. And uh, Manfred Henningsen, who is a, an emeritus retired political science professor from UH Manoa, uh, who has studied this and various other political science issues in the United States and in Europe, uh, is here to join us for this discussion. Welcome to the show, Manfred, as always. Thanks a lot. So uh, I'll tell you about the should, by There's one thing you should tell, you should mention, you know, I was born in Germany and I grew up after World War II in a country that avoided uh, talking about uh, the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, that changed only 20 years. It, it took more than 20 years until, uh, you know, Germany uh, entered into the processing of its uh, macro criminal past. Uh, it started uh, in, when Willy Brandt became chancellor in West Germany in 69, but it became in a way uh, really uh, very, very powerful in the 70s. So all of that silence you know, that you had before uh, was gone. And uh, so from then on, you know, uh, the Germans confronted their past and I think um, came to terms with it. Uh, and it's, it's taught in schools and universities, you know, and that's very important. And a lot of what you see in Burns's film about American history, the parallelism is not really taught in American public schools. And I think uh, what we are confronted with is now a political movement in the United States that wants to even further minimize, you know, the teaching, the critical teaching of history. Yeah. Well, we see that increasingly. Yes. And, and we know where it leads when you don't teach history, it leads to right. a repetition of history. Uh, Santayana, wasn't it, uh, you know, it, and yes. if you ignore history, you are doomed to repeat it. And some people say, no, 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 that's not true. It rhymes. It rhymes with history. But I, I, my reaction more and more, Manfred, is that it's not a rhyming. It's right. an actual repetition. Well, in, in this particular case, yes. And then, it's, we, you know, when we I mean the role of Charles Lindbergh, for example, I think is pretty unknown to most Americans. You know, he is a heroic figure and that he became really the first American fascist um, and was celebrated in Nazi Germany by Hitler and, and other uh, Nazi leaders like the leader of the Luftwaffe Göring uh, is unknown. I mean, and he is buried in Hana. I think no, most people in Hawaii don't know that this super American fascist uh, is buried in Hawaii. Now the grave has not become a shrine uh, and I don't know whether it ever will be, but uh, what is so interesting when you listen to his speeches, you know, in this documentary, uh, there are echoes today, you know, of what he is talking about and it's uh, sickening. Yes. But he wasn't the only one. No, no, he was not the only one. There, there were, were organizations, uh, even yes. organizations that have names that are the same as names that are of organizations that are popping up today. America right. First, that was a Nazi organization. And then there was something about the um, Christian Christian League or something along those lines. Right. And those organizations were, were pretty violent. Uh, they had guns, guns uh, stolen from the army, ammunition stolen from the army. They had people 
who were in the army and their, their mission, their sworn mission, which they expanded to various places around the country, thanks to uh, Father Coughlin on the radio, uh, who actually reached 40 million people out of a total population of 120 or 30 million people. That's a huge percentage of people. Right. These organizations were dedicated to blowing up the United States government, uh, to assassinating a whole bunch of federal officials, congressmen and the like, uh, and taking over in, a, in an overt violent coup. And, and the public was not really opposed to that. Um, it's, it's really hard to understand. And the reason I'm fresh on this is because um, only this week, Rachel Maddow has gone into her podcast, which is called Ultra. I recommend everybody take a look at it or listen to it because it's, it's historic. And she describes these, these events in the 30s and especially 1940 in great detail and talks about these organizations uh, with, with some degree of detail and accuracy. And it's well worth knowing because just as you say, it's repeating itself. Right. Well, I mean, what is so remarkable about American ignorance, historical ignorance is that they are not only not aware of this fascist, this fascist past, but the racist past, uh, you know, that is connected with uh, the legacy of slavery, the anti-Black racism. And when you see these parades of the KKK in New York and in other cities, you know, in, in, the, in the documentary, it, it scares the hell out of me, you know, because uh, you have signs of that today. Uh, despite the fact that you could say, you know, a lot of progress has been made in, in the area of civil rights, but nevertheless, there is a, a level of uh, racism that is very, very, that goes very deep and has not uh, been uh, taken care of. Uh, no. So what you have is not only, you know, this uh, fascist, the anti-Semitic, uh, background, but you have also the, the general racist um, background that people do not want to be taught uh, about in schools. I mean, I mentioned the, 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 the non-anti-Semitic uh, background because for Hitler, uh, American history became a model. Uh, you know, the genocidal removal of Indians uh, became for him uh, an argument when he was designing, you know, in World War II, the move into the Soviet Union in, 19, in June of 1941. And, uh, you know, the uh, trying to, to conquer the agricultural core of the Ukraine and uh, and and Russia. Uh, so he used openly, you know, uh, references to the way the United States, uh, you know, took care of the native people and uh, removed them or killed them. Now the other thing is uh, the Jim Crow laws, the race laws were used by the Nazis as a justification for the Nuremberg laws in 1935. I mean, you have a, a book by uh, James Whitman which was published in, in 2017, Hitler's American model, the United States and the making of Nazi race laws in which he shows the parallels. Uh, so you, uh, I mean, you have their, when you talk with American students about it, even though I'm retired, I mean, I remember having these discussions, they were always shocked uh, when I mentioned that, you know, that uh, America's race policies uh, were looked upon by Hitler as a model for what, uh, you know, he was doing, including the eugenics, uh, the sterilization 
uh, I mean, you have it in Judgment of Nuremberg, you know, one of the great movies about World War II with Spencer Tracy, you know, playing a uh, Supreme Court judge and uh, being at the center of some of these uh, trials in, in, in Nuremberg, uh, they were totally unaware of these parallels. Well, I, it was a race, wasn't it? I mean, in the sense that, um, I, and I'm speaking now of, uh, of the Ken Burns uh, uh, episodes, um, that Hitler wanted to keep this quiet. He, just, he didn't want people to know that he was right. uh, running a big death machine and he was dedicated to killing every single Jew in Europe. And in fact, his, uh, the killing was way ahead of where um, American observers thought it was. And right. by the by the time um, you know he finished, Hitler had actually killed two thirds of the Jews in Europe. That's right. a lot of that's millions and millions of people. And and in the U.S., uh, the the general perception was yeah, there was some articles in the newspaper, Herald Tribune in New York, um, talking about uh, maybe two million when in fact it was four or five million. Right. <laughs> and so um, you know what happened is Hitler won the propaganda game. He lied about and he didn't tell anybody about the killing machine and in the US we were oblivious and we didn't believe it um and 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 there was a, a Nazi propaganda machine in the US that was um that was um that was telling us that no 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 this yes, is only by, rumor it's not real information run by american nazis yes yeah so i mean at the bottom line there was like uh, it was a contention of the truth versus the lie. Right. And for a good part of the war, the lie won out. Right. And there were, you know, all kinds of uh, people, you know, who uh, did not counter this lie. You know, when you think, for example, of the, the story with the, with, uh, the American State Department, but the same applied to the Foreign Office in, in London, you know, to, to deny extra visas to uh, German and Austrian Jews, uh, even though these, uh, I mean, they could have submitted, they could have gotten visas, uh, but the resistance within the State Department and in the Foreign Office to helping them was absolutely uh, amazing. You know, uh, now whether that was uh, simply a bureaucratic behavior or whether they were anti-Semitically uh, influenced as well is not completely clear, but I think there were a lot of anti-Semites uh, working um, within the foreign service in the United States that did not want to let thousands of Jews come. I mean, this the story of the St. Louis, you know, that ship uh, that uh, went from Cuba, Cuba, you know, to um, Florida and then back to Europe. Now, most of them did not end in Auschwitz or any of the other death camps. It's many went to Great Britain, but uh, some went to France, but then they had to flee you know, once uh, Germany um, occupied uh, France. So that story is a sickening story, uh, if there is any. Well, talk about sickening, you know, I, I, uh, you asked me before the show, what, what, did, I, what did I learn from this uh, Ken Burns documentary that I didn't know before and, and um, Somehow, uh, I became emotionally uh, involved, uh, invested to a degree that I have never been involved before. Uh, and I began to see things um, through the eyes, not only of the survivors, but of the people who were killed. And, and, and you know, that's the, the lesson of history. history. The history is told by the survivors, not the ones who were killed. And in this in this particular documentary, you begin to see it through the eyes of the ones who were killed. Anne Frank is a good example, you know. 
a teenage girl and uh, worried about, be increasingly worried about, you know, and, and the thing like little, little, little uh, transitions. For example, recently I saw a movie called The Garden of the, In the Garden of the Finzi Contini which is an Italian movie made in the early 80s. It was the second time it was made about a wealthy Jewish family in a town called Ferrara near Rome. <clears throat> and it, it's so interesting how the walls closed in on them. Uh, first thing is they, they couldn't go on public transport. And then uh, they, they all had bicycles. Europe was so heavy on bicycles. So they got around on bicycles, no big deal. And then the Nazis said, including El Duce, the Nazis said, you can't have bicycles either. You have to turn your bicycle in. And now you have to walk on the street and you have to have a, a Jewish star on you. And you have to have identification papers uh, that, you know, confirm the Jewish star. And if you had no Jewish star, um, and, but you had identification papers with a J, uh, you were in trouble. If you had the identification paper, if you had the um, Jewish star and the identification papers didn't say uh, Jewish, you were in trouble. I mean, they would haul you away. And so, you know, it's this seeing it through the eyes of the of the decedents is what struck me and involved me. And I think everybody should see it that way because um, those people, they speak to us. They speak right. to us today. They speak to us through that film. No, no, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned just the J. Uh, you know, that was a demand by the Swiss and the Swedish government. For, uh, they asked uh, the German um, Foreign Service to have uh, Jewish citizens get this J stamp in their passports. So it was a request uh, that was uh, issued by the Swiss and the Swedes, you know, to identify, to help uh, their um, pass control to identify people. I mean, this sickening uh, implication, you know, of governments in the, the sickening bureaucratic involvement, you know, of the Swiss and the Swedish government in facilitating, you know, uh, this uh, has also not been known. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a, a question. It's slightly academic, but I've been thinking about it, you know, that they say the 20th century was really rotten. Uh, we had World War I in which millions and millions of people died for no good reason. Um, we had, um, you know, all this um, uh, bigotry in the 30s getting worse and worse. And um, I, I, I don't know if you can say that FDR saved us uh, by, you know, what he did during the war, but um, it was getting pretty bad. And then we had World War II, in which millions of people died, and there was a lot, a lot of lying and propaganda going on, and a lot of, um, you know, a genocide going on in, in the cruelest, most mechanical way imaginable. And of course, this this film helps us understand just exactly how cruel it was um, to people. So the 20th century really, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't stand up very well as a, an enlightened period for the benefit of humanity. Um, even even those moments where it seemed to be enlightened, I'm not sure you can say it was. Now, here we are in the 21st century, which is revealing itself. Um, 2022, 2023, um, and we like to think that this country is enlightened, um, and maybe for you know part of the time in the 70 years or so since World War II, it had been, relatively speaking, enlightened. But is there any, this is my question, Manfred, is there any good reason why the 21st century can't turn into a disaster in the same way the 20th century did? Look, I, I had a colleague, Rudy Rommel, who published five um, studies on what he called democide. He didn't like uh, the ethnic connotation for the mass killings that took place in the, in the 20th century. And he, for that reason, used demos instead of ethnos. And he said in the 20th century, um, 160 million people were killed in non-war activities. 
So he did not include uh, the war casualties. And uh, when you're looking, when you're listening to American politicians, you know, talking about um, the situation today, it's as scary as it was in the 30s. I mean, the immigration issue, for example, will, the migration of millions of people will grow uh, radically as a result of the uh, ecological uh, crisis. So what you have, you know, at the southern border in the United States, you have uh, at the borders of all um, developed countries in Europe as well as in, in Asia. So, but there is no, there is no general policy, you know, to deal with humanely with that. Uh, there is an avoidance of that. I mean, when you listen to the rhetoric, not only of Trump, but all of his uh, followers, uh, you have the same thing that you have, you know, that motivated Swedes uh, to vote for, you know, the Sweden Democrats, which are the neo-Nazi party in Sweden. Uh, they don't want to have people come in that don't look like them. You have the same in Hungary, you know, with Orban, it, you had the same thing in, in Poland. Um, they, it's a xenophobic disease, you know, that is uh, in Western countries spreading like the plague. And uh, so for that um, reason, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not optimistic. Lest we forget, the plague killed a good part of Europe. That's right. Uh, again and again. Um, yeah. And and so uh, I put this question to you now. So we have had the Constitution, the rule of law, it's been you know at least theoretically quite remarkable over the history of this country. And it's been a, a, a you know it's a city on the hill. It's a leadership point, and our political system is is in many ways admirable. But we are now at a point where not everybody believes in that political system and the social compact is therefore threatened. Right. Uh, and so we, we may have a situation where uh, the people who uh, uh, hold the, uh, the offices in Congress and in, in the Supreme Court and all that don't believe in it anymore. And if they don't, you know, that changes things. Now, a lot of people feel, Manfred, I, I'm sure this has happened before in history. A lot of people feel, so what? So my life will be the same. So what? We don't have the rule of law. So I'll still go to work every day. I'll get my paycheck. I'll be able to buy a car. Um, I'll be okay because it's, it's, it doesn't really affect me. And on the other hand, I say to myself, and as a lawyer, you know, so an observer, I say to myself, Gee, no, that, that can't be true. Because if you, if you undo the rule of law, um, you are also undoing the rights of each individual citizen. And we take those rights for granted. We have for many years. And if we lose them soon enough, like riding a bicycle down the street of Amsterdam in 1940 or 41 or 42, you know, you may have to give your bicycle back. You, you may have, you may lose the rights you've been so, um, you. But you have to you have to remember you know when you are when you are praising the American Constitution, this American Constitution uh, included uh, the enslavement of eighteen percent of the people living in seventeen eighty nine in the U.S. Um, it didn't include Indians; uh, they were excluded. So what you have here is a genocidal dimension of the constitution that otherwise you could say was really an extraordinary document uh, compared with all other societies uh, in the world. Uh, so when talking about the United States, when praising it, one always has uh, you know, to remind oneself also of these deficiencies that were there. 
I mean, the, all, the first time slavery was mentioned in the constitution was when it was abolished in the 13th amendment. Um, so, uh, and you know, for, for that reason, I think talking about, critically about the American constitution, its achievement has to include these negative dimensions that become quite obvious, you know, in, in Ken Burns uh, documentary, which I think is an extraordinary documentary. You know, I did not expect uh, him to do something like that because normally he is in the business of celebrating America, you know, and this is not an uncritical celebration of America. This is a very, very critical portrayal of the United States. Uh, and uh, before the background of the sickening uh, history of Nazi Germany and all of its um, the victims that it has been responsible for. So uh, when I'm listening, you know, to when I'm listening to Republican politicians speaking about critical race theory and what it really means, namely being anti-white, then I'm getting sick, you know, because that's not what it does. What, uh, you know, when I taught classes that had politics of race that included, you know, a critical reading of American history, and making kids understand that, you know, you cannot uh, leave out these negative dimensions. You have to include them in your, in your discussion of American, of the greatness of the constitutional framework of this Republic. If you don't do that, you know, uh, you are simply perpetuating something that uh, is, uh, really responsible for some of the things you know that have and still are occurring in the United States. I mean I when I'm when I'm when I watched Ken Burns, you know the documentary and when I'm listening to when I'm watching um, uh, Christian Amanpour's interviews you know with a lot of politicians it's absolutely unnerving, you know, to listen to some of these guys. Well, they're not only guys, they're also some crazy women, you know, some of them are worse than the men, you know, in, in their uh, fascist uh, policy statements that they are making. Um, you know, the, the Congresswoman from, from uh, Georgia Green, and others that are running for office now. So what you have there, you know, is there are fascist tendencies afloat. And I think what is so remarkable about the Ken Burns documentary is that you can make the connections that, between uh, these tendencies that were afloat, you know, in earlier parts of American um, history and have never been critically included in the self understanding of American history. Uh, you know, this unwillingness to look in the mirror, uh, I think is not hypocrisy. I mean, it may be having this impact on people looking at the United States as hypocrisy, but it's, uh, it's a will to be not informed. Uh, and Is it that, related to American exceptionalism? Yes. Uh, you know, I have some problems with that notion, American exceptionalism, uh, but this e exceptionalism uh, has justified a lot of harm that people do not want to confront, you know, they don't want 
to talk about it. I mean, coming back to the, you know, to Pearl Harbor in this book, Inclusion, uh, I think it's a remarkable book about Hawaii being exceptional in the way it dealt with a crisis that could have torn apart, you know, the state. And the refusal to in turn to put 160,000 people of Japanese background into camps um, was an extraordinary achievement uh, that has to be praised. But I think Kaufman, the author of the book, is wrong when he says it had an impact on the mainland. It hasn't because uh, Americans, mainland Americans don't know Hawaii and they don't know this dimension of Hawaii, polit Hawaii history and Hawaii politics. Uh, and I don't know how one can, how one can uh, make mainland Americans understand Hawaii as being exceptional because it has all the features, you know, that could make America great. Um, and well, you know, you suggest that there's really two Americas. One America is moral and kind and caring, and the other America is hatred uh, and bigotry and immoral or yes. amoral. Uh, amoral, and, and, amoral, yes. And, and, the, and there's a tension between those two forces in our mm, political world, let's say, um, that, is, that is always at play. These right. two vectors fighting each other for, um, to prevail. Right. And uh, the question I put to you is, uh, can you remember a time in the United States, uh, I guess we have to accept the Civil War, um, when those two forces were so um, aggressively um, in contention and, and further that it appeared that those who would like to bring the country down may very well prevail, uh, even more likely than the ones uh, Rachel Maddow talks about in 1940 and the, one that, the ones that Ken Burns talked about in 1940. Well. I am slightly optimistic that this disaster will not happen in November and in 2024. Uh, but I'm, I'd say only slightly because uh, I, I, I see the possibility, you know, that um, American politics can go down the drain. Uh, and, uh, I'm too old, you know, uh, to leave. Uh, and I must say, you know, as a, as a people, as a person with a dual citizenship, you know, German and, and American, it would be uh, maybe a good solution to go um, to Germany. But you see the, the German story is, interesting, not only because I'm German, but because I think they have come, they have come to terms with their, the evil of their history. And they, whatever, you know, reminds them of that in actions that they get involved in, um, becomes uh, tempered, you know, by this knowledge. I mean, the hesitation that the now present uh, Chancellor Scholz, the social Democrat has always in delivering weapons to um, the Ukraine is informed by this historical knowledge. You know, mm -hmm. he is against war. He does not want to uh, not only start a war that may, you know, end in a nuclear, <laughs> Um, ex expansion. No, he 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 is t somehow he is tempered, you know, by the history of German history, by the by the knowledge of German history, uh, to not go as easily in the direction, you know, that he is urged to go 
by uh, his colleagues in the other European countries. So in that sense, uh, the German situation is a very good illustration of what can positively happen if a society faces the evil of the macro criminality of its past. Mm -hmm. But you cannot make that, you know, you, you cannot make a decree that people have to, to do that. Most countries do not do that. You know, they don't want to face that history. But as you mentioned earlier though, Manfred, it took 20 years for Germany to actually uh, address this. And for 20 years, as you said, they were silent. silent. Yes, I grew and up in silence. That's a long time. And yes. if you say that right now, uh, we in this country have a pervasive level of ignorance, willful, even right. intentional ignorance, Right. Uh, it would take a generation at least to yes. correct that in the schools and among the population in terms of education. And so that's why, among other things, that's why this Ken Burns movie is so important because it, it talks truth to power. It talks truth to ignorance. Yes. Just but as remember, important. remember the German story is different in one respect uh, too. Germany got bombed twice in the 20th century uh, back into sanity uh, in World War I and in World War II. And these experiences um, are part of the German memory as well. You know, uh, so in, 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 in that regard, you know, and you could say the sanity that uh, Germany signs of the sanity that it chose, political sanity that it chose today was all, that it became sane was also the result of Germany being after the war occupied by four power, by the four powers. Uh, hundreds of thousands of troops were staying there, you know, from 1945 to 1990 when the unification uh, took place. Uh, so Germany had the luxury, you know, to, to grow up um, and get out of that denial, um, the silence of denial, mm -hmm. because uh, the forces that may have wanted to prevent this reckoning with the history to come to, to, to occur, they were contained by the occupiers, by the hundreds of thousands of American, British, French, and Russian troops. Germany, Germans could not take it out on each other. Uh, the same, you could say, happened in Japan, uh, you know, but there were only the Americans. Um, you could have gotten a civil war in Japan in, uh, after August 1945 uh, easily, you know, there were a lot of people who were angry. Uh, so, you know, American politicians forgot this, for example, when they moved into Iraq, um, Shiseki, you know, the, the, the local the Japanese um, general who was asked in the Congress hearing, you know, how many troops do you think we should keep? And he said, well, 200,000 at least. And he was laughed out of Congress. But that's what should have happened. You know, the Americans should have learned from the success in Germany and Japan um, that, you know, you cannot simply defeat the regime and then leave. Um, if you want to be successful, well, I think the German stories of, and the Japanese to some extent also is the best lesson you can you can get, you know, yeah. don't well, leave. We don't have that. We don't have that. We, we, we have a disintegrating civil society, a disintegrating democracy, and we don't have anybody to, to tell us that. And, and as a result, in my opinion, the accelerates the disintegration. But, right. but let me, let me, we're almost out of time. We are out of time, Manfred. And I just want to ask you uh, one, one question if you could address, and that is, so here we have this Ken Burns film, um, and we have uh, the Rachel Maddow podcast, both historical, 
um, both dealing with what happened in the 30s and the 40s, and to some extent after that, immediately after the war, in this country <clears throat> as a historical study. And, and the funny thing is that, um, that comes now. It comes now. It comes at a time when our democracy is clearly um, under threat and disintegrating visibly. Um, is that, do you think that's a coincidence? Or is this something that was intended by both of them in order to teach us, just as you say, we need to be taught? You mean both of when, what do you mean both? I mean, I, I don't Ken, know- Ken Burns the, episode. And, and Rachel. And Rachel Maddow's treatment of the, of the history of um, fascism in the United States in the 30s and 40s. You know, I, I wondered, I mean, I did not expect Ken Burns' documentary be what it really is, an incredible achievement, uh, intellectual uh, achievement, and being honest in a way that is absolutely remarkable. So I, one would have to ask him, and I don't know whether that was intended, that was the motivation. It's possible, but you see what I find also interesting is how little have been, has been written about the, doc, the documentary. I haven't seen much. I haven't seen any editorial comments, you know, in the New York Times uh, or in other places in journals, you know, that may still come. But I have been waiting to see, you know, a public discussion about uh, this documentary. I don't know why nobody talks about it. I mean, but you. But uh, us. But yeah. think tech, I feel like we're ahead of the game on this. And I agree with you. There hasn't been enough public discussion about this, this incredible uh, documentary, but I'm happy that uh, you and I can talk about it and other shows on think tech have talked about it. And we're not finished with our conversation. So I hope you'll circle back with me and we'll have a further discussion about it, Manfred. It raises yeah. so many issues, so many no, no, critical absolutely. issues. Yes, and it's wonderful to have these conversations with you. Your, your openness is uh, remarkable. Thank you, Manfred. Manfred Henningsen, uh, a regular uh, political science emeritus guest on Think Tech. We greatly appreciate your time and expertise in having these discussions. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.